welcome you all uh, for today's session on education for uh, conservation by Rotarian Christy Thompson. Rotarian Christy is a Rotary member of Rotary uh, Club from uh, Australia. Uh, just to tell you briefly about our uh, uh, group, we are a group of like-minded individuals who share a common interest, that is wildlife and its conservation. We meet usually on the fifth day of every month on virtual platform, uh, but for uh, reasons uh, stated earlier, we are meeting today on the 9th and all our activities are conducted independent, uh, but in harmony with the policy of Rotary International. The purpose of our uh, fellowship group is to create awareness about importance of wildlife to promote lasting friendships and encourage participants to form fellowship chapters in their respective regions, countries, and have exchange programs with each other to witness and explore the wildlife of that region uh, while supporting each other's rotaries, rotary projects. Uh, our fellowship through Rotary Clubs and their community allies are working towards taking action for protecting habitats, enhancing the capacity of local committees committees to support natural resource management and conservation and supporting education initiatives that promotes behavior and that promotes uh, the environment. Welcome you all once again uh, today's, for today's uh, session. Uh, over to you, Shweta. Uh, Shweta will introduce us, our speaker for the day briefly. Thank you, Rotarian Sanjay Krishna. Uh, I'm unable to switch on my camera. Kindly excuse me. A very good morning to one and all. Rotarian Christy Thompson is a wildlife ecologist with 23 years experience in the industry working with Australian wildlife with recent focus on practical koala conservation practices. I have a special interest in Kenya after visiting the private community wildlife conservancies a few years back and have since started the Marifa Foundation to provide education for conservation for school children bordering the conservancies in Mara and Amboseli. I'm from Hope Island Rotary on the Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia. Thank you, everyone. Over to you, Sanjay. Thank you, Shweta. Now, without uh, wasting much time, we will uh, go to our speaker today. Uh, over to you, Christy. You can share the screen. And uh, I request uh, uh, all others to stay muted. We, at the end of the session, uh, we will have a question and answer session. Uh, please feel free to ask the questions by raising hand or in between, if you feel like asking any questions, please post them in the chat box so that uh, you know we can take note of those questions and ask the speaker at the end. Thank you, over to you, Christy. Thank you so much. Um, again, thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you for, um, first of all, letting me be part of your group. I think I joined um, uh, maybe six months, 12 months ago. So it was a really special find. Um, so thank you. I'm hoping you can see my full screen at the moment. Yep, lovely. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, my name is Christy Thompson. I am the director of the Marifa Foundation, um, but I'm an ecologist by trade, um, working in the industry for uh, quite a number of uh, years now, um, predominantly focusing on the Australian wildlife, but I've always had this obsession with Kenyan wildlife. So it is not surprising that I am where I am at the moment, um, working in, in, in Kenya, because it's just such a beautiful, special place. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of where we've... Oops, I can hear... So is that, was that a question? Sorry. No? Um, Please go ahead. Nashmi, can yes. you mute all yeah, and I'll do that. Yeah, unmute the speaker all on. Thank you. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, uh, so yeah, we'd like to give you an overview of uh, the charity, the work that um, I'm a part of and introduce you to the team. Um, hope you enjoy the presentation. Um, just to give you a little bit of uh, background about uh, how it all started. Um, well before we started the charity, there's a little story behind that as well. Um, most of you would be familiar with the private conservancies. Kenya is certainly leading the way in terms of the community conservancy model. Um, so our story begins well before our foundation, and that is the story of the, the community conservancies, which have been running for 
close to 30 years, if not more. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about two conservancies in particular, both that I've visited before and I suppose it, which is why I started the charity. So we've got Selenkei Conservancy and Okinye Conservancy um, in Kenya. The Selenkei Conservancy is in the Amboseli ecosystem and Okinye Conservancy is in the Mara ecosystem. And they were established many years ago. Selling K is, is, is close to 30 years ago. And I think that is one of the very first private conservancies established in Kenya. Um, and it was a conservancy established as a land lease agreement between the local Lassai communities um, and a local eco tour company. And that eco tour company is Game Watcher Safari, headed up um, by its founder and owner, um, Jake Greaves Cook, who is. Um, quite pivotal, was quite pivotal in the hotel industry and is certainly the, I suppose, the godfather of the, the private conservancy models in Kenya. Um, so as part of the agreement um, that was made all those years ago and continues to be renewed is that land that the Maasai otherwise cleared and grazed um, for their cattle because they are traditional nomadic herders um, was a set, instead set aside for conservation and set aside as low density ecotourism. Um, in return for dedicating their land to conservation, they received financial benefit and it was by way of employment opportunities. So it was camp staff, guides um, and other financial opportunities provided um, to them by setting their sand, land aside for conservation. And of course, the regular rent that they received from the ecotourism companies um, from actually renting the land themselves. Um, so it was a great little model. It, it chugged along very nicely for several decades and more and more conservancies popped up through um, Kenya as they proved very, very successful, beneficial both for the local community, um, for local tour companies, for conservation across Kenya, and of course us as tourists getting to come visit these very special places. But then as we all know, 2022 hit and the world changed forever and it saw a downturn turn in tourism. Um, which severely impacted this, um, this level of income. So for a good period of time, there was no tourists coming at all. It's really only just starting to trickle back now as those pre-COVID levels. Um, but there was, a, as you can understand, immense flow down pressure. It wasn't just tour companies that were going under or really struggling. Um, it was these lands that were under threat and all this, the lions, the elephants, the impalas, this land set aside for conservation became un under threat. So this is when I started to have my own little um, panic. What, what happens now? There's no tourists, they're losing their jobs. These people can't afford to send their kids to school. There's no money to, um, to buy food. Uh, you know, Maasai traditionally aren't, um, they do not eat wild animals, but what happens if they, um, you know, have no food? Like, do they turn potentially to poaching? I'm a doomsdayist. So I had all these terrible thoughts of all these things were happening. So my thinking was, well, how can we help? How can we not, how can we stop the undo of all the good that these few decades have created with the conservancies? How can we keep that conservation step moving forward so what could we do to show support for the community who supports the wildlife how could we demonstrate to these Maasai communities that conservation still pays for so many years we'd come as tourists and we loved what they showed we loved being part of their culture and loved seeing the wildlife loved the information they were sharing with us about their wildlife and then all of a sudden we weren't there it felt like we were turning their backs on them through no fault of our own. It felt like though we were turning our backs. So how could we show them that conservation still pays? How could we show that we still had their backs? Um, the opportunity was for me quite simple um, because of the skill set that I had, because of the connections that I had. There were certain things I couldn't do, but there were certain things I thought that I could do. And that's why I thought, education for conservation. So in the very least, what we could do is help their kids still get an education. And in the first instance, it was, okay, dealing with school dropouts. So if they couldn't afford their kids, send their kids still to school, maybe that is something that we could help with. 
But what's even better is looking long term and go, right, well, can we get that conservation message um, built into these kids at this young age, at least support, better support that conservation message in these kids at a young age so that we're better protecting this conservancy model. So these future wildlife custodians in the future still want to lease their land to wildlife and still want to conserve the wildlife for whatever reason, whether it's for income, for pure naturalist point of view, um, for whatever reason, to show that there is value in conservation. So education for conservation, that's where it all started. <clears throat> Very much guided um, by this quote. It's, it's really pivotal to what we do. Um, it's my favourite. In the end, we will only conserve what we love. We will only love what we understand and we will only understand what we are taught. Um, that's the basic philosophy of the Marifa Foundation. Through knowledge brings opportunity and through opportunity brings change. So our goal, our long-term goal, our big goal is we want to improve the livelihoods uh, of the local people. And if you can improve the livelihoods of the local people and you can do it through sustainable living, um, you've protected the natural environment. So we're helping people and we're helping planet. That's essentially the goal of what we do. Um, our mission, we want to inspire a future generation. So as I was saying, those young people, if we can instill this message of conservation and the value of conserving the natural assets of the land, um, we can develop these conservation minded citizens just as we are as a group together here we are all like minded conservation citizens but if we can get that into the younger generation um, that's absolutely fantastic for the future we want to build these strong sustainable communities if we've got sustainable communities we've got a sustainable environment as well um, we are community driven so it's not about um, you know a bunch of white people from Australia telling the Maasai community what they need to do. It's very much a community driven project. Um, it's grassroots. We are all volunteers um, and we are working with the Kenyan people, with the Maasai community um, and working with them in these communities that border these important wildlife areas. And so we are quite small. So we have chosen just two schools um, in these two conservancies, uh, but the idea is we, we expand and we grow and, and, and we help more and more children. Um, but it focuses on these important wildlife areas because it's our way of saying, thank you for dedicating your land to conservation. Um, and here's what we would like to do is um, to be able to support you. <clears throat> Um, so we work with the Kenyan communities, but there is also an opportunity to um, work with the Australian communities as well. Um, if COVID has taught us nothing else, that we are all, all part of a global village, that we've all heard the saying, we're all in this together. And there was a great opportunity to actually close that gap between the different countries and the conservation challenges because there were so many synergies. We are all dealing in each other's countries with our own conservation challenges, but there are so many synergies between those challenges. So we decided to work with our school kids here in Australia as well. It very much comes from my background with working with Australian wildlife and um, particularly koalas um, and to a lesser extent, the macropods, the kangaroos and wallabies, but trying to teach some of the kids here in Australia about the important values of our wildlife and conserving our wildlife um, in Australia but also partnering them up with the Kenyan schools and learning about some of their challenges as well. So what we wanted to do with the kids here is we wanted to have them identify what are their local environmental challenges and how can we help them improve their local environment? It's about empowerment. If we think that you just have to rely on the politicians, the governments, um, or even for these kids to rely on the adults to make a difference, um, that's not the case at all. You can feel very helpless if you think that that is the case, but everybody, whether you're five years old all the way up to 90 years old, you can all make these small differences um, to help improve the environment, as we all know. As part of this program, we looked at um, not only working with their own local environment and how they can improve it, but also teaching them how to be good global citizens as well and connecting them with their global classmates in Kenya. Um, we also wanted to bring in a, the wider community as well 
um, to inform them of some of the challenges that are happening, not only overseas, but here in Australia as well. So who we are, um, it's just like your introduction about um, the wildlife Rotarians. Um, we also, as a, as a charity, are a few like-minded individuals. As I said, we are all volunteers um, from Kenya and Australia, and we decided to take action to provide ongoing support. Um, and we've decided to do that through the younger generation. So here's our team. First one, myself. Um, Professor Daryl Jones, he was based here in Australia, but is now in Kuala Lumpur. He's a very well-known um, wildlife ecologist. Uh, he's just retired after 37 years at, uh, at Griffith University um, here in Queensland and is now a quite a well-renowned um, author. He's had several books published on wildlife movement solutions and particularly animals in the urban environment, wildlife in the urban environment, his specialty. And I remember going into his office one day while he was still at the uni and I um, uh, presented this idea to him and I literally got out of my mouth, I've got this idea about how we can help the Maasai communities in Kenya help their wildlife. And he goes, sold. He goes, you had me at Kenya. So um, he's been part of the team right from the start. Our other two directors are Alex Brady and Alyssa McLeod, they're early career ecologists who um, in 2020, just as before the borders were, were shutting for COVID, I took them on a study tour um, to Kenya to show them some of these places and it formed part of their university degree. And they fell in love with the place as much as I did and they've been part of the Marifa Foundation ever since. Um, then I said, as uh, we work with people in Kenya, so we've got Daniel Maimai, who has been a friend of mine since my very first visit to Kenya. He's an elder in the East Selenke um, community. He's part of the Ilkosonko tribe of, the, of um, Amboseli. Very intelligent man. And between him and I, it really was, uh, you know, he, very much his brainchild. It's something he's been wanting to do for a long time. And I think it was just one of those moments in life where two people on the same paths crossed. We've joined forces and we've been um, working together ever since. Now, we piloted it at one of the schools in his location, but based on its success, we decided to add an extra school to our, to our program and we wanted to work in the Mara. And another man that I'd met on my travels who I also trusted very much is Ben um, Tongoyo. So he is from Kishimaruk village. Um, he's from the Perko tribe, which is the, the Maasai Mara. Um, and he's our other project coordinator that runs the Kishimaruk um, primary school program. Uh, we've got two educators and I can just see the gap in my presentation where I meant to uh, drop a photo of Nixon. So apologies about that. But we've got Joyce, uh, Joyce, who's our educator who we've hired. Now our educators are the only people that receive um, a payment through our program. As I said, the rest are volunteers, but we saw this as a community development aspect in itself we interviewed and we provided employment to someone in the local community of that particular school that we were working in so Joyce and Nixon are our educators our Marie for educators we wrote the programs here in Australia um, we sent them and run them by our delivery partner through also by Daniel and by Ben by the schools themselves um, and they were local, they agreed that they were satisfied with the content, locally relevant um, and age appropriate. So Joyce and Nixon are our educators who deliver the in-class and also our field-based excursions um, for the students involved in our Mazingira clubs. And Mazingira, um, for those that aren't, uh, don't speak Swahili, is environment clubs. Uh, I should also mention our delivery partner, we couldn't be doing that without them, is Game Watcher Safaris based in Nairobi. They very much act um, as, our, as our middleman, um, how we have to set up a charity here in Australia. Money has to go, it can't just go to individuals. Um, so through the Game Watchers Wildlife Habitat Trust, we set out a program of items that we want to fund. We send it to their Wildlife Habitat Trust and through payments to those various aspects, suppliers, contractors in Kenya. Um, and they help very much also practical delivery, you know, the logistics of delivery is if I'm buying library furniture, they will actually pick it up in Nairobi and they will transport it out to the schools for us. So we couldn't be doing it without our delivery partner, Game Watchers. Um, just having trouble 
switching slides, hang on a second. Here we go. Um, so to ensure that we were meeting the needs of the local people um, and not just delivering we, what we thought that they needed, we established two committees. So we have our Australian committee who um, you mostly uh, just met in the previous slide. And then we also have a Maasai advisory committee. Now that Maasai advisory committee is chaired by our project coordinators, Daniel and Ben, and they have a group of up to seven other Maasai community members um, who were voted in as part uh, from that local community. They get together um, on a quarterly basis and they very much plan out the, the following quarter's activities. They approve um, curriculum, they um, coordinate dates, they coordinate activities, um, they yay or nay different sustainability project ideas that we come forward with them. So nothing happens in either of those schools without consultation and the okay of the Maasai Advisory Committees. Um, this idea is very much um, derived by the fact that community and conserva conservation, they're not two mutually exclusive um, factors. They literally must go hand in hand if any project is to be successful. If you come in as an outsider without that internal support, without the support of the local community, you're bound to fail. So our Maasai advisory committees have been absolutely invaluable in spearheading us in the right direction, keeping us on task and ensuring that we have the support of the rest of the community as well. Our goal is to empower the students with knowledge and opportunity. So it's not just about classroom lessons either, but we needed to give them the tools to be able to think through sustainability projects and actions that they can take. And what we wanted to instill in them is a real passion for wildlife and a real passion for the wild places that we're tasking them to protect. But if you don't have that love and that understanding, just like that quote says, how can we ask them to protect that? So by, protect, by fostering the protection of the natural environment, um, we enhance livelihoods, um, which in turn helps wildlife, which is our goal. So our primary goal at the start was very much the conservation aspect, the wildlife. We're all ecologists, our background is, but you can't do it without community. And the best way to do that is targeting the younger generations. As mentioned, we very much model ourselves on a, on a global village and three primary drivers. So share, experience, action. So we want to empower the students to share knowledge with each other. We want to give them experiences and we want to allow them and have them want to take action. So share is about sharing knowledge with other like-minded students not only within their own cultures, but with other cultures as well on that global platform. Um, and we do this through letter writing opportunities. We share photos and stories. So we have several schools here in Australia that write letters to the Kenyan students from the two schools and the Kenyan kids actually write letters back and they share all sorts of information such as what they're learning about in school, what their favourite animal is. They share lots about their culture, about where they live, how many brothers and sisters they have, what they like to do on the weekend. And I think that's just amazing. Um, I know the kids here in Australia, they get a real kick when those letters arrive because they just can't believe that someone from the other side of the world has written them a letter and they just can't believe that there's these kids on the other side of the world that might have to walk two kilometres to get to school, that might live in a mud manata, might, um, you know, these various things. And it's the same as well with um, some of the similarities that we've got kids writing to each other about how they play football and, you know, from the opposite sides of the world. So it's been a great um, activity for the kids to be involved in. We give them experiences and otherwise that aren't accessible. So we've got kids that live an hour and a half drive from Amboseli National Park and Maswai Mara National Reserve, yet they've never been able to visit these very places that we're tasking them to protect. Um, they don't have opportunity. They don't have the funds available to do that. So we've made that happen. And one of the, one of the really, um, I suppose, heartwarming uh, feedback I got from our educators was they went and were observing lions and elephants 
in a way that, as you can see in that top photo, the elephants are just drinking water. They're not a threat. They're not threatening to raid their crops. They're not threatening to, to trample their village. Um, but just seeing animals in their natural habitat experiencing or demonstrating natural behaviours. So they saw these animals in a different light, not just in that human wildlife conflict light that they may have um, only ever experienced these animals in from where they were living. So those experiences got them to see wildlife and nature through different lenses. Action is our third driver. So taking simple direct action for immediate and future positive impact. And it's what I was saying before, what are the, some of the small things that these kids can be involved in that can change a difference? Um, to make a difference into the future. It can be planting a tree and looking after it. It can be um, picking up rubbish at the school. Um, it can be recycling. It can take it just better care of your local environment. It's all things that we can all do, as you know, um, but certainly empowering students that they have some control over their future as well. <clears throat> So we're approaching just two years in operation. Our anniversary is the formal um, anniversary is October when we officially become registered as a charity. Um, and I'm just going to go through a snapshot of what we've achieved so far in Kenya. So we've delivered locally relevant education for conservation sessions. And these have included in-class PowerPoint presentations on different topics, including human wildlife conflict, threatened species management, Fencing and wildlife has been a big one for anyone that's sort of familiar with some of the problems or threats that, that happening in Maasai land. It's the subdivision of land and the fencing and the interruptions to natural migration corridors. So we're, we're trying to um, keep contemporary information and, and sharing this with the students. Um, and we've been delivering these life changing field trips, as I said, showing animals, showing them animals through a different lens. And what we have at each school is two Mazingira clubs set up at each school. Each class has 30 students in it. So across the, across the two schools, we've got 120 kids involved. And that's 120 20 kids that are involved in every week. There's an activity, there's a lesson or an activity or some sort of way that they're involved in a conservation activity to do with the Marifa Foundation. So it's not just a once off, here's some information, set and forget we go back and we build on that previous learning and we build on it. So they, we have them into two classes. So you have one year go through, then they move into the second year program. And after the second year program, we then bring another um, lot of 30 students come through. And those 30 that have graduated, they then become the mentors for the rest of the school. And they visit other schools and talk to other schools about what they've learned. They, they talk to some of the other students that aren't part of the Mazingira Club. Um, about what they've learned and the opportunities. They, are, they do become those school leaders for the future. We've supplied essential school stationery, classroom furniture and learning technology, such as laptops, projectors, um, uh, school furniture, like for the library seating, um, bookshelving, all their stationery and school books and so forth. Um, and as mentioned, we've employed two education officers from the local community. And if you look to the right of your screen, that man to the right, that's Nixon, our educator, who I didn't put a photo in, in, in earlier on. Um, the other things that we've done is we've provided tuition fees um, in the early, very early days, as I said, when we were still in COVID and they were still very much shut to tourists. Um, we paid school fees for 21 students at the time from the Ilarero Primary School. And since this time, this has been up to 50. Um, and then just at the start of this year, we've been able to add an extra 16 students from Kishimaruk Primary School who are boarding students. Their fees are a lot higher. Um, and that has been thanks to a corporate sponsor, Solomon's Group, who have committed to delivering on this every single year for us. So it's a brand new bursary program that we've got. Uh, we also bought, to get them started as well, uniforms, shoes, solar lights to study after dark. Um, we've put on school lunches. Um, and what we've promised is that we will continue um, with those sponsored students. So those 50 students and those 16 students is it's not just one year, we'll pay it every year. 
you will get your school fees paid. If we become even more financial, we will add on to that 50, but those 50 and those 16 that we've already got in the program, we will continue to support those students and continue to support those families. We've completed stage one of the Mazingira Library um, at both of our schools and we've delivered more than a hundred, uh, sorry, a thousand nature themed story and reference books. So we're trying to make these spaces for children to come and learn. So when they're not in the Mazingira classes, they can come and learn about particular aspects of nature or conservation that they're interested in. It includes anything from outer space to, you know, the Arctic. It doesn't have to be limited to Kenya, but just to really um, quench that thirst for knowledge that these kids have. We've delivered it in a staged approach. So even though we're small, we're not waiting till we reach that magic high marked, you know, target value we broke it down into smaller components. So straight away, they had shelves with books. And to start off with, they had to go into the teacher's um, office to actually be able to grab one of those books. But now we've got library space at one of the schools that's now be turning into a, a, a classroom library. Um, we're at the point now of designing a green building for Ilarero Primary School, which will double not only as an extra classroom because they're so short of space, they've got 60 kids crammed into a small room, but will also become the new Mazingira Library for Ilarero Primary School. Um, and we're looking at all sorts of ways to make that building itself um, a learning aspect. So we're looking at sustainability options for building that. So we're looking at recy using recycled bottles um, to build the walls of the building using natural light and ventilation, um, all those subtropical sort of design features to um, make it a learning feature in itself. Solar panels on the roof, tanks attached, sat gardens around it, plenty of shade and open space um, to make it that real green sustainable building. Some of the other things that we've done, as mentioned, installed water tanks. We've initiated a Maasai Mothers Jewellery Social Enterprise. So some of the mothers have gotten together and they've been making jewellery and we've shipped it here to Australia and we've been selling it here in Australia. So whatever the, um, the women asked for in price, that's what we paid um, for the items. And then we shipped them here and then we sold them with a, you know, upsell, a, a markup because that markup then went back into the projects at the school. So as we, as we said to the women, it's an in, a direct income source for you as well, but anything on top of what you asked for will go directly back invested into the school, which then further supports that your, the, um, the school that your children are a part of. Um, we've held award ceremonies to celebrate the efforts of outstandingly um, future wildlife leaders. So based on their performance in the classes, we've identified those that are leaders and they receive special rewards. We have special ceremonies and celebrations. Um, they've planted 100 trees in and around their schools, which they um, care for. It's their responsibility to care for and look after. Um, and we've also organised several one-off food and supply deliveries when things really get tough for the local families. Um, Daniel and Ben set out budgets of what we need to support the local families that really in need. Um, and, and those items are purchased to, to just take the pressure off during these tough times. Um, what we've been doing here in Australia, very busy as well. We've delivered our Koala Champions programs at two schools. We've exchanged over 180 letters with students in Kenya. Um, we facilitated paying it forward. So it's about, we run these activities um, for the classrooms here. We have Zoom calls from koala enclosures from um, wildlife sanctuaries so the kids can meet koalas and, and read books and talk to experts. Um, but at the same time, these kids are also involved in their own fundraising activities, which we then use to buy books and library shelves for the kids in Kenya. And they see where their money has gone to. So they might raise $500 and we show them, here's the $500 of books on the shelves for these kids to read in Kenya. Um, so it's about paying it forward, being good global citizens. We've recycled over 60,000 containers um, to help fund our program. So in that bottom right hand um, corner photo is uh, a bag, the orange bags. So I don't know if, it, if it's the same in India and, and some of the other people that are here today in your countries, but we have 10 cents per bottle that is given back um, 
for water bottles, soft drink bottles, beer bottles. If you can recycle those, you get 10 cent back. And so we very much um, uh, mobilized a community here. And so that's $6,000, 60,000 containers in, in less than a year, we've been able to raise just by recycling these containers. Um, that's 60,000 containers that haven't gone to landfill. So again, we're helping our own local environment here in Australia while also helping someone else. My second favourite quote, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world um, by Nelson Mandela. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're only small. We're not expecting to change the world. But if we can change the lives of those kids and those families that we're helping, then we're happy campers. Um, we've achieved what, what we set out to do. So I'm just going to play a short um, video. Um, it's just one that we recently um, launched at our community event that we held. And uh, I mean, in pictures and videos and just a few words, I think it sums up pretty well what we do and why we do it. Um, Christy, is there an audio to this? Um, uh, we, uh, uh, we can only see. I think when you <coughs> share the screen, Christy, oh, okay. Hang you on. need to turn on the audio for the uh, sharing. Oh, okay. Um, oh, how do I do that? Uh, so when you share the screen on Zoom, there is an option which says include the audio. Oh, okay. All right. Um... You can try sharing again. I will stop the share. Oh, share sound. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, it's only, I've got to install an audio device. It won't let me. Um, Sanjay, would you mind if I send you a quick link to this video? It's just a YouTube one. And um, could you play it at your end? Rashmi, will that, yeah. can we do that? Yeah, we can try that. Yeah, 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 please. Okay, please. I'll just, um, sorry about that. It was all, technology was flowing all quite well then. <laughs> so if I just put it in the chat, is that okay? Yeah, that works. Fine. That's fine. Thank That's fine. You. Okay, I've just put the chat there. So I'll allow you to, to, to play the video and then you just tell me when to get back into my um, presentation. Is it possible, uh Rashmi? Just give me a second. People have always loved the beauty and wonder of Kenya. From the open savannas of Limara, 
to the rich swamps of Amboseli. We are drawn to explore its natural beauty and contemplate its diverse wildlife. To see the cheetahs, lions, gazelles, and wonderful bird life. And also to meet with the people that fill Kenya with their hearts and their smiles, with their culture and traditions. But it's the children that call this land home that will make a difference. They are tomorrow's wildlife custodians. And it's our purpose to empower students with the knowledge and cultivating them a deep-seated passion for nature and wild places. Because in the end, we will only conserve what we love, we will only love what we understand, and we will only understand what we are taught. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Sorry about that, everyone. But um, there was a little bit of like delays, I think, with the internet and everything like that. But if you wanted to have a look at that, um, uh, again, anyway, the, the link's now in the, um, in the chat there. So um, uh, play from current slide. Uh, oh, I need to share my screen, don't I, again? Okay. Um, so yes, thank you. Thank you for your patience just then. Um, so um, how to be involved. We always tell when we go to different events or um, speak to the community that um, attend one of our events is a great one. We hold an evening um, every year called an evening out of Africa, very, very fancy um, dinner with the community um, that live just around me here. They've very much gotten behind this charity right from the very start. They're the primary recyclers, um, donate and support to this charity so much. They've very much taken it on as their own. Um, we've got membership opportunities as well, where we become a friend of Marifa and various different things, such as discounted Kenyan safaris, if you were here in Australia, um, discounts to um, different attractions here in Australia as well, um, and opportunities to adopt an acre of conservancies in Kenya through Game Watchers. Um, we also um, give, provide the opportunities to become a sponsor. And as mentioned, we've got Solomon's Group at the moment who sponsor um, one of our bursary programs. And we've also got the general individuals that like to just buy um, library books here and there, provide funds to provide library books here and there. Um, and we also um, ask anyone that likes what we're doing to like, share, subscribe to our newsletters, connect with us individually um, and just help us spread the word. Because um, I said, we're all volunteers. None of us have any marketing or, or real charity promotion um, backgrounds. So we just, we run on passion and we run on the um, being able to share that passion with others and others see how dedicated we are to it. Um, and then wanting to be involved. Um, but then we also look for partnership opportunities where someone might be running a program in Kenya or in Australia. And rather than us reinventing the wheel, we just come on and see how we can support, whether it's by manpower or financial um, support as well. Um, so that brings me to the end of my um, presentation. I've got a QR code there down the bottom. If anyone's interested in, it connects you to everything. It's one of those link tree ones. It connects you to our website, to our Facebook, to our Instagram, to our, um, our YouTube and uh, also email as well. Um, so I thought I'd just whack up that on there. Anyone that's interested in reaching out or, or maybe following us on the socials. Um, but that brings me to the end of our presentation. So a share lang, which is thank you in Ma language. Um, any questions at all? Oh, I can't, I can't hear you. Are you talking? Yeah. Uh, yeah, oh, that, yeah, got you. 
that was a wonderful presentation thank you christy thank you uh, we have uh, we'll go over to the questions if there are any uh, mm -hmm. anybody wants to ask any question please uh, raise your hand in the meanwhile there is a question you can also type it in the chat box uh, there is one question from uh, mr vikram uh, what it says is uh, is there an opportunity for schools colleges to get more formally involved in these programs where it could ultimately even lead to exchange programs or even credible channels of for, for funding from corporates for programs since alumni of those schools colleges are more likely to trust such programs than a charity they may not know well so if you if i uh, i may repeat is yeah, there an opportunity yeah yes yeah you got so the question you, yeah I, yeah i can't see the question on here um okay anyway i will i will i will just send it send it again yeah so is there an opportunity for an exchange program is there is that what you're saying yes so, yeah so maybe i can explain it so yeah. basically, uh, you know you folks are um doing a great job of involving australian school kids in the programs and mm -hmm. but from an institutional perspective if you look at it right and that usually works differently and i think the rotary has seen that over a long period of time that institutional uh, programs tend to last longer and they're passed over generations than you know specific uh, volunteer efforts so if if you looked at let's say you pick two schools and two colleges in in australia right mm -hmm. and they said they are going to uh, uh, tie up with and adopt let's say a few schools in your program the ones that you're covering go you know beyond what you folks are doing as volunteers there could be a formal channel for both uh, funded exchange programs for those uh, children there could be funds that are released for the programs to expand the scope of those programs mm -hmm. all of those and also because if you look at it both corporates and alumni and individual donors as alumni of these schools and colleges they tend to trust their uh, alma mater more than uh, probably charities mm. not, not, a, not a reflection on what you folks are doing with the marifa foundation but uh, in general you know if they are not familiar with uh, the charity but if their school told them my, I, i know for sure that if my school or college had reached out to me to ask for it i would uh, you know uh, definitely direct either my personal law or my company's uh, funding towards those programs is that something that you uh, uh, explored is what i wanted to know it is now in um like as i was saying that our backgrounds all in ecology so running a charity is very new to all of us um and as i said we we're, we're all volunteers but one learning that we have taken it is very hard to get into schools um and the schools that we have been able to get into are ones where we know someone there whether it's we have a connection to a principal or it's someone's kids school that we've been able to get there but what we are finding is that these schools already have their big set charities they're not interested in something small like us so for example um my sons go to a, a catholic school and i really thought that this would be a great opportunity because it's st francis of assisi which is st francis was supposed to be the protector of all animals and environment and schools preach about how wonderful they are with the environment but they do nothing to do to help the environment but they're guided well they're not guided they're told what they must do by the catholic church there is also then the state government ones who here in australia they're only allowed to do things that the state government allow them to do so i know what you're saying and i would love to be able to find that avenue but at the moment i haven't been able to find that avenue in there um to get the schools to buy into us more than these small scale stuff to do anything bigger so i like your thinking and if you could if you've got some ideas on how to do it we're learning the whole way but yeah that, that's some of the challenges that we're finding at the moment is that people really only want to work with these big ones like world vision caritas and you know these big established organizations that then all franchise schools that they all just use the same charity the same big one and obviously you know as a group of six um we just don't have that capacity so yeah we're on a who you know type basis not 
you know, we're child fund world vision credibility. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks for that insight. I think that's so, yeah. That's, that's yeah. I love your idea and maybe one day we will, we will get there. I know we've certainly come a long way in two years. Maybe but, the, yeah, the, yeah, the ins and outs are really hard. Maybe then the Rotary can step in and help with that because that's that's a way to channel that because Rotary has more credibility in that case. So that yes, yes, and that is what I've found so far. As soon as someone says that you're associated with Rotary, oh great, Rotary. Um, so yes, no, you're very much right. The I mean the other thing where we're at at the moment is you know as I said we we are all volunteers so we all all work. Um, so it's about making sure that whatever we do, we still have control over because what we want to do is make sure that anything we do, doesn't matter how small it is, is successful. Um, at the start, we had all these grand visions of all these big, wonderful things that we were going to do. But then as we tried to do them, we weren't doing them very well. So what we've tried to do now is really hone in on what our core is and where we can really make a big difference. We build on it each year. But just making sure that whatever we do, we do it well within our capabilities. Nice. Thanks. Thank Vikram. you. Thanks for asking. Thanks for the question. question. Thanks for the lovely answer. Uh, over to you, Jyoti. Uh, you, I see that you have raised your hand. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christy, for the wonderful presentation. And thank you for finding the time to talk to us as well. Uh, it was quite educational. Um, I, I want to actually go back to the uh, the beginning of the presentation and um, ask you what happened uh, in your experience and in your observation, what happened during the pandemic? Um, I know the uh, education programs is a, is a long term uh, investment in time, effort and energy, right? Uh, so what really happened during the pandemic when the tourism uh, inflow went down and uh, did you find evidence uh, for increased poaching or what was really the situation so that was my first sorry uh, I have one just one more question um, is also um, you talked about how you were uh, including um, the uh, advisory committee from the community and how it's a, it's a bottom-up approach uh, to education as well, right? Could you tell us a little bit more about how, um, uh, how you are including traditional knowledge of conservation and uh, nature in your curriculum and in your stories and uh, yeah, in the general education program? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. So first question, um, more generally, the uh, some of the impacts that happened across Africa, so whether it was South Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, was that there was an in increase in poaching. Um, we were very lucky in our conservancies because they still had the support of the local tour operators. Um, rangers were still employed. Um, so these, these areas were quite protected, but there was an increase in poaching. Um, there was an increase in um, school dropouts. Um, because parents just simply couldn't afford to send their kids to school. And when they had so much time at home, I think they spent about nine months at home. When it come to the point of sending kids back to school, there was some of that age, and it's particularly the girls, with some of that age, it was just like, okay, well, they were 11 or 12. Well, after 11 months, nine months of being off school, well, why would I send them back now? They're almost at that age where they would be leaving primary school, potentially getting married, um, then there was also, there was families that got very used to having the extra help around the house in terms of looking after the cattle, the sheep, domestic duties that a lot of them didn't get sent back to school, even if they could afford to. So that was some of the, um, uh, the impacts that COVID had. Of course, there was complete job loss as well. Um, we were very lucky in the conservancies where we worked that although uh, there were a few people that didn't have money coming in, the camp staff and um, some of the guides, game watchers were very good to them. They all got pay cuts, of course, but that was to um, ensure that no one fully lost their jobs, um, that they got something in. Um, but, the, you know, it still had a massive impact on many families and those that didn't have a job who relied on the money coming in from, um, you know, village visits or that extra bit of money that maybe their family, extended family member would send home, um, it, it wasn't there. So that, that certainly was some of the direct impacts that 
I know happened at the conservancies, but broader, um, more generally, increase in child marriage, increase in school dropout, um, increase in, um, um, oh, I've lost my train of thought, but yes, there, there were some quite significant impacts that um, occurred right across the board because of um, that COVID. So conservation was under threat and there was to a point that if um, tourism didn't come back, if did, Kenya in particular, because that's the one I followed very closely, if they didn't manage the COVID situation the way that they did and open back up when they did, there would be no way for these ecotourism operators to continue paying these land leases. And then that's where um, some of these problems would have occurred. I haven't worked out whether it's a direct correlation, but ever since COVID, there's also been a mass sell-off of land, a subdivision of land. So I, I wonder, and I, it, it, I thank you for this question because I'm probably going to follow up on it to see if it was directly as a result of there's been a lot of selling of land subdivision which then made people want to fence their land it's now disturbed migration corridors and all sorts of things so i would guess that covid was at least somewhat of a driver in making that happen because people needed money and subdividing their land was a way to get that bit of money and there was a second question. Yes, cultural and, um, you know, native way of life into the curriculum. Yes, very much so. So, yes, I wrote it um, here from Australia, but I've, I very much modelled it on some of the learnings and teachings that were already being done by organisations like Big Life Foundation, which are very active in the Amboseli um, environment. Then what I did was I sent it off um, for review by the Mass Advisory Committees in particular to, to be looked at by Ben and Daniel and also the conservation officers at Game Watchers to ensure that it really was locally relevant. Um, some of the specific lessons in there were um, tracks and traces which I developed from scratch um, but the idea of that was and this is some of the feedback that I'd received from um, the Maasai communities, that when you send the kids to school, they no longer have that natural need or that ability to learn off their fathers and older brothers and uncles, the ability to um, track animals or look for animal traces, because that is a that is a, a technique that's learned by herders because they have to, as a herder, you need to know where the lions are, where the hyenas are, how to track your cattle if it get they get out of, you know, if they lose the rest of their herd. Um, but when the kids go to school, they lose this ability. So what we did is we added that as a whole lesson in itself, plus then a practical lesson of teaching the kids about tracks and traces. And then we send them out with the Maasai elders to actually go and put that into practice. Um, so they went out and learned all about bones and feathers and scats and tracks and all these other techniques that the traditional Maasai elders use on a daily basis to, to live and survive in, 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 in the bush in Kenya. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, now we have uh, Rotarian Sanjeev. Uh, Sanjeev, you may go ahead and please ask the question. Ah, uh, good morning. Hello, how are you? I don't know what. <laughs> I don't it's know after, what it's afternoon here. Yeah, afternoon here. <laughs> okay. I'm right here in Nairobi, Kenya. Oh. Yes. Awesome. Uh, I, was, I was just there two weeks us. ago. Yes. Okay. Oh, awesome. okay. That, that's yes. great. Yeah. So yes, it's it's great to see what Marifa is doing. It's it's very much needed, and as you said, it's it's a few. It might be little, but a lot of you are doing a lot of little, and a lot of the little drops are creating a whole stream of activity out in Narok, and and in the Maasai land, and it's it's mm -hmm. certainly creating loads and loads of pathways to help conservation. Mm -hmm. uh, Rotary Foundation has just, in fact given us a global grant to another partner organization, Humans for Education, similar to yours. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, my club, which I just got president of here in Nairobi now, is the local partner club. And uh, we're going to be running a, a women's empowerment program over there, mm -hmm. specifically to help the ladies also cultivate their own economic activity so that they can support their families and uh, as thus aid and continue to conserve all that wonderful land. So it's, it's definitely fascinating. And yes, as Rotarians, we are here to do what we can 
and partner with organizations like yourselves and continue doing good. Super. Yes, thank you for giving us time. No, thank you. Sounds like we might, um, our, our projects might cross paths or there might even be opportunity to work together on um, some things in the future. Certainly, because even humans for education are currently supporting schools. Mm -hmm. They've got about five schools there out at Sekanani where they're supporting activities. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things is that that was that was one of the sample projects that they showed us of how, how they're working on ground. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a very exciting that uh, people globally are recognizing that it's it's not a Kenya problem. Mm -hmm. It's essentially a global problem if, if you want to conserve one part of the world which has managed to sustain all the ifs and buts that humanity has brought about and and and, and literally kenya is one of the hotspots which has still got a good amount of wildlife available in its own natural habitat yeah and if if, we, if if the world doesn't do anything then yes the effects of global civilization as we call it are going to affect this land and uh, in the next few decades it'll probably be like Nairobi National Park, where we have suffocated all the migratory routes, so the park dies. Yep. Yeah, agree. I mean, Kenya is such a magical place with such rich biodiversity. I, as I said, I just got back from um, safari and the, the game viewing and the, the vast open spaces and just Kenya's, um, they're just so progressive in solar power and they're just, it just amazes me and, and sometimes I get a little bit, well, a, a lot, I get disappointed in my own government, my own country here that, you know, you've got a country like Kenya that is still very much de developing. Yes, it is one of the most advanced of, um, you know, on the African continent, but, you know, we've got so much to learn from how Kenya do things for conservation. I think it's, it's more of like, it's in our face. It's, it's something we need to do. And if mm -hmm. we don't do it, we've seen that this is just going to be a bomb in our face. So, yes, everyone is making efforts to ensure that we do a little bit. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. Um, and I'm Great. a big believer in not inventing the wheel. So if there's any of your projects that you think I can help with um, or information that I might have, I'm always happy to share. I don't keep anything. We don't keep anything to ourselves. It's all about getting the message and the outcome Um you know, the outcome still, we've got the same goal. doesn't matter who does it. I don't care who takes credit for it. So, yeah, anywhere that you think we can help. And no, I, 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 I read the spirit. All of you are volunteers and it's not easy to do this. We ourselves are volunteers and we're running up and down Narok and, and we're doing this um, out of our own initiative. And yes, as I said, every drop counts. Mm, and if, if yeah. the more that we come together... It's just literally like nature, you know, that every drop makes a little stream and every stream mm -hmm. eventually forms a huge river. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's what humanity needs to do. Yeah, agree. So we'll stay in touch and, and let's see whatever we can do together, we will definitely do together. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, uh, in fact, it was very relevant. I was uh, about to ask uh, Christy, uh, that if she has explored the possibilities of involving uh, Rotary Clubs in Kenya. And um, I see that the connection is already happening. That's mm -hmm. the whole purpose of our group, right? So, Absolutely. Sanjeev, I think uh, uh, you should uh, connect and take this forward, take it forward and see what best you can do. Uh, that will be really amazing. Sure. Christy, um... Do we have your email contact here on the chat or? Um, I can Sanjay put them in. I can put them in right yes. now into yeah, the you chat. Can, you can put, put it in. Uh, I also have, but uh, yeah. Yeah, then we will drop your line. I'll share with you what we are currently doing with Humans for Education. If you look it up, it's, it's H4E. H4E, uh, yep. Yeah, Humans for Education. The lady, the CEO is Daphne Fariser from California. Mm -hmm. So she, she initiated, they've been operating on projects for the last five years. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've had a couple of Rotary grants earlier also. And just now, as, as we're speaking, at the end of the year of Rotary year of June, we've managed to successfully get a grant of about $70,000 wow. to continue with the project. And yeah, yes, we, uh, my club, my, I'm involved very much in the forefront because uh, I lead my club and we are the local host club to mm -hmm. coordinate the project. But going on ground, putting our hands on ground gets a real feeling of what, what the value of, of what uh, 
what's happening and how it's impacting every child out there in Europe. So yes, we will stay in touch and let's see what we can do together. Sounds good. Look forward to I, it. Thank I you. Didn't know, I didn't know, Sanjeev, that you are the current president of Rotary Club of Nairobi. Congratulations. Yes, I was. <laughs> thank you, sir. I just I just came in now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, Rotary Muthaiga. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rotary Club of Muthaiga. Nairobi is a uh, Kalpas yeah, yeah. club. Yeah, yeah Kalpas, Kalpas president Kalpas was uh, yes. President ba Barot, Ritesh Barot, who is now the AG for my club. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> yes, small world. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Christy, uh, I just wanted uh, to know from you, can you, can you please be more specific about this uh, bursary program that's uh, being done by any any one case, if you can give us an illustration as to how this is being done, it sounds very interesting. It's all. Uh, I also find it quite easy for a Rotary Club to do. Uh, mm -hmm. and if we can support our uh, fellowship group, can support it, will be nice. So Absolutely. can you please share more uh, details? Yeah. So we've got we've essentially got two. So um, we've got what for Alero Primary School. We started with them because they're our pilot school, um, and this was also particularly because when we were just starting, we didn't have the huge budgets. Now, to send each uh, child to school um, from Ilarero Primary School, it equates to fifty Australian dollars per child per year. Um, so at the time, we just did a fundraiser and we reached a certain amount of funds and. 21 students was what we could afford to pay. So then for this year, um, what we did at the, um, at the annual evening out of Africa dinner is we set a target that we wanted to do 50. So once we got to that 50, we got the $50 times um, 50 students. Um, we sent, simply uh, asked the Maasai Advisory Committee to work up with the school based on eligibility criteria. It had certain things like... Um, uh, you know, single parent, orphan child, uh, parent with a disability, various things that made them qualify for most in need. Um, and then we simply wrote a check to the school and held a, a school fee celebration where we invited all the parents and the students um, along and a check was formally given to the school. So we keep a list of what grade they're in. We also have the Maasai Advisory Committee go do home checks. So they will go and do a home check um, every six months and they go check on the child to see that the child is um, uh, well fed, he's doing okay in school, his solar light still works, his school uniform still fit, um, and also just making sure that that intent attendance rate is still up at school, seeing if, if there's anything else his family needs. So that's done as a report and sent back to us. So we monitor that during the year. This year, we've been able to start um, the bursary program at Kishimaruk Primary School because we had a corporate sponsor came up and they nominated amount of money that they would like to put forward. So after some careful thought and to make sure that we could help as much, many students as possible, this particular bursary program was we would sponsor 50% of the school fees for 16 students and they were all boarding students. So it was quite expensive. We could either do only eight students and pay it all, but our philosophy very much was that, um, you know, a parent, and, and I had the same philosophy of why I send my children to private schools as well, um, is that if you are a parent that wants the best for your child, you will do anything possible to give that child an education. So that's when we thought, okay, well, the whole 50% means that we can double the help, the double the amount of families that we can help, but parents or a parent is still actively participating in their child's education. Um, so that's how we came up with the, the bursary program and the breakdown. Again, it's the same criteria as what we use for Alero. And again, it was the, um, the NAROC Maasai Advisory Committee headed by Ben with the school head teacher that came up with the list of students that we would support. We do have a uh, policy on both that we want a minimum 50% of those students to be female. Um, in the first year, we said we want to get to 50%, and I think it was slightly more boys than girls. 
Um, but as we came into the second year, that policy came into to place as a solid must. You must have 50% of the children you choose being females. And that's the same policy we have for our Maasai Advisory Committee as well, that we have our chairs, they're not counted, that's Ben and Daniel, because that's that level of trust that I have with them. Um, but the rest of the Maasai Committee, there is to be a minimum 50% girl, 50% female representation on those advisory committees as well. So Solomon's group have said that they um, would like to continue this year after year. Um, so they will continue paying 50% of the school fees for their 16 students. And I'm hoping um, that we have a bumper year in fundraising and we'll be able to increase that 16 bursary program up to a higher number. That's nice, uh, thank you. Um, Anyone else who wants to ask any questions? Uh, we are almost at the end. All right. I think uh, that's it, uh, Christy. And uh, before I propose a word of thanks formally, uh, I would like to read out a couple of uh, thank you messages uh, that I see in the chat box. Uh, a friend from Madagascar, Rotarian Hango, has thanked you for the presentation and sharing. And a friend from Kampala, um, Tasli May, says, uh, Asante Sana, nice mm -hmm. presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and Abai from Bangalore says, nice presentation and awesome work. Um, and Hari says, congratulations, Christy, wonderful presentation. Loved how you have multiplied the impact by partnering Australian schools with Kenyan schools. Amazing work. Um, in a, uh, yeah, that's it. Thank, thank you so much, everyone, for the for the positive feedback and the questions as, as well. Um, in the chat there, I've got um, my email. Um, obviously, we're also connected on WhatsApp, and I've just put our link tree there as well. Um, if you did want to check us out on on the social media. Please don't judge my social media skills as well. As I keep saying, I'm an ecologist. So I'm learning Facebook and Instagram and everything else as we go. <laughs> I Thank sort of you. pride ourselves on being a bit rustic though. So that's okay, because I can honestly say that every dollar that goes to our project or goes to our foundation goes to our project. None of it's wasted on, you know, hiring marketing managers or social media or anything like that. We we learn and do everything ourselves. So everything's a bit rough around the edges, but I don't mind it that way. That's nice. We need pe more people like you, Christy. Oh, thank you. thank you. Appreciate that. I'm just so lucky to be part of this group. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rotarian Deepali, would you like to say something? I just wanted to say thank you for the beautiful presentation, Christy. I did have a few questions, but they got answered along the way. So I did not have the opportunity to ask. But thank you so much. <laughs> Beautiful presentation. Thanks so much, everyone. I must congratulate you for the wonderful work that you're doing. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Uh, as you're all aware, Rotary is a member organization doing humanitarian service. Uh, a fellowship group is one of member engagement programs under the Rotary umbrella. And uh, today, uh, thank you, uh, Rotary and Christy, for helping us engage our members by letting them know what Marifa Foundation is doing and also uh, sharing some of your ideas on how we can work towards conservation by making communities uh, sustained. Uh, thank you all the participants from different parts of the world uh, and from the country uh, as well as uh, from different clubs in Bangalore. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, last but not the least, uh, thank you Rashmi for uh, uh, supporting uh, back end with all the uh, tech support. Uh, thank you. Thank <laughs> yes, you. Thank, thank you, Christy. Thanks so much. Yeah, let's stay connected. Thank you. All right. Sounds great. Bye bye. <laughs>